Excited Utterance, The Evidence and Proof Podcast, Episode 134, Heidi Liu, Provisional Assumptions. Welcome to Excited Utterance. I'm your host, Ed Chang from Vanderbilt Law School. Excited Utterance is your podcast for cutting-edge scholarship and developments in the world of evidence. We bring virtual workshops to you throughout the academic year. This week, our guest is Heidi Liu. Heidi is an associate professor of law at George Washington University. She teaches torts and evidence, and her research focuses on decision making, particularly in the discrimination and evidentiary context. Our podcast today features Heidi's new article, Provisional Assumptions. It was published last year in the Southern California Law Review. In it, Heidi takes on jury instructions to disregard or otherwise not consider evidence. In the practice of evidence law, we see these instructions all the time. The jury will disregard the witness's last statement, or, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you are not to consider whether the parties were covered by insurance. But while these instructions are incredibly common, I don't think any of us really believe that they work very well. We accept the fictions because they enable the trial system to work, but we all know that they're fictions. Heidi, however, offers a new idea. What if rather than telling jurors to disregard or not think about certain kinds of evidence, we instead told jurors to assume a provisional fact. So rather than saying, don't consider insurance, we said, assume that the party doesn't have insurance. Would that fix the psychological problem? My interview with Heidi finds out. Heidi, delighted to have you on Excited Utterance. Welcome. Thank you for the invitation. I'm delighted as well to be here. I think most of our audience is going to be familiar with the target of your paper, which you call jury admonitions, when courts tell jurors either to disregard inadmissible evidence or use it for a particular purpose. And I think it's safe to say that most of us in the evidence world has long suspected that these admonitions basically don't work. They're fictions. But at the same time, I think that probably most of us don't have a good idea why they don't work from a psychological perspective. So to start us off, can you tell us a little bit more about that? What are some of the reasons why jury admonitions don't work? Yeah, so absolutely. It's the case that these admonitions to disregard information are often, as you said, quite fictive. And there's been a lot of research showing that not only do jurors not disregard, but they also sometimes engage in backlash. They might actually yield higher damages amounts after they hear a admonition. But there are a couple different theories in play for why jurors wouldn't consider information. One comes back to a theory of mental control. And I'm going to just tell a story, which is that Often you'll hear some psychological studies that say, don't think of a white bear. So take this famous study. It's really about how often to think about a white bear. And so the researchers divide everybody into three groups. They say, we want you to ring a bell every time you think of a white bear. They ask one group to do that. They ask the second group to say, you know, think as hard as you can about white bears and ring the bell when you do so. And then this third group tries really hard not to think about a white bear, and they have to ring the bell too. And it's this third group that rings the bell the most, suggesting that it's really hard for us to mentally control what not to think about. And it's really specifically harder to not do something like disregard information when you keep thinking about not doing it. 
There's a second theory in play too, which is psychological reactance, which is that folks tend to act out subconsciously when there are constraints on their autonomy. And so you might see that in these studies that show increased damages after someone has given an admonition to disregard information that's quite salient, for instance, to a plaintiff's or defendant's financial prospects or whether they have insurance on hand, as in my paper. And so it's very difficult, I think, ultimately for people to not consider information, especially if that restraint or admonition is constantly in front of them. It's hard to disregard things that they're constantly asked to disregard. One of the natural responses here, and you talk about this in your paper, is that courts should just be more careful about blindfolding the jury. So in other words, we should use in limine motions more often so we don't have to do this admonition or this idea of disregarding evidence at all. But you suggest that that doesn't solve the problem either. Why not? Yeah, so I think that courts have a lot of tools at their disposal. And as you've mentioned, that they could use them. They could use motion and liminates. They could use rule 411, which is already in there. And of course, you know, we have just talked about jury admonitions, both in the curative aspect and perhaps right before the deliberation. But I don't think that they're quite as useful because one, leakage is always possible. I think it's hard to say that this gatekeeping exercise is going to work all of the time because I suggest that admonitions backfire. But the second thing is that juries speculate. And one of the things that I think about in formulating this paper was Sherry Diamond and Neil Vinbar's, among others, really incredible Arizona jury project. And so they were able to get access to recordings of jurors. And what happens there is that there are these jurors who have been instructed not to consider various things, including insurance information, and they end up speculating about that very thing even though they have no information on the books. They didn't even have any affirmative exposure to this information at trial. They just knew that it mattered to their thinking and they raised it themselves and this they speculated about it. And in fact, it's sort of interesting because at some parts they go up and they ask the judge and they say, is there any insurance? And the judge says, I can't answer that question. And you end up in the situation where the jury is thinking about it and they're really frustrated about not thinking about it. And the judge has acted correctly under our rules of evidence and has said, actually, we said we weren't going to consider this under a motion in limine. And yet that way of thinking has already injected into the jury's deliberations. If I remember correctly, in that Diamond and Vidmar paper, or at least one of their papers, they suggest because of this speculation concern that the better jury instruction is not, I can't say anything or disregard it, It's that you want to explain why the evidence is inadmissible or why the juries shouldn't speculate. Are those tactics any better? I do think that they are a little bit better than just telling juries to disregard the information at all. I think that we ought to value juries generally as decision makers within the broader range of legal decision making, especially as they've kind of been put in this position. I think that is helpful. I will say that there has been a recent study that suggests that you want to actually ask jurors that one intervention that's successful is to say, hey, imagine the consequences if you decide a case on inadmissible information. Imagine if this happened to you. That actually has seemed to be the most successful approach. It's just that it's hard to imagine integrating that very particularized personal approach at trial. And so I think that there is something to be said about giving juries more information and explaining the process to them, but it's not a complete solution. So the alternative that you propose in your paper, which I find exceptionally creative and interesting, is what you call provisional assumptions. Tell us more about how these provisional assumptions work. Sure. So I'll say at the outset that The way that I was thinking about these interventions is that if admonitions aren't successful because they focus attention on the thing that's supposed to be disregarded, that we actually ought to try to shift folks away from that information generally. And one of the things that I took inspiration from was actually a lot of public health studies or studies in psychology. If I can just move to cigarettes for a moment, there's sort of behavioral evidence from smoking cessation 
that in order to stop smoking, it's a lot better to replace the habit than to just purely ignore it at all. And so my hypothesis in this paper was to say, this might actually be more applicable to jury decision-making than we thought. It's easier to change focus than to remove it. And so a provisional assumption relies on that same intuition. If we want people to ignore salient information, if we want them to not speculate in the jury room, then we actually want to fill that absence with something specific. And so instead of telling people to find and delete inadmissible information, we actually want them to find and replace it with something that's really consistent with how we want them to decide. What we want them to consider is saying, assume no insurance, at least in the case of Rule 411. I love this idea that if the jury desperately wants this gap filled and is likely to speculate in this space, you just fill it for them and just tell them to do something instead or give them the thing to fill that gap with. You offer two psychological studies in your paper to show how this provisional assumption idea might work. And unfortunately, we don't have time to get into all of the details of those studies, but I was hoping that you might be able to give our audience a basic idea of how those studies are set up and then some of the main takeaways or results from those studies. So the general setup is that I am using two classic vignette studies. And in these studies, participants are asked to pretend that they're jurors in a trial about a car accident. And actually, this is a real life trial from Texas that I've adapted that has been used in other studies that calculate damages. And so participants read through the scenario. It involves a accident between two cars and it's clear who's at fault. And what's really important in the study is that the participants are essentially divided into two groups. Half of the participants receive this provisional assumption and the other half don't. And so during the introduction, only those half of the people in the treatment condition see an extra statement which says that assume neither party has insurance. Assume the plaintiff doesn't have insurance. Assume the defendant doesn't. And so they get a description of the accident, of the injury that this plaintiff is suffering, and then a quick discussion of the damages the plaintiff has suffered. So after everyone reads the scenario, I bring in an original measure to understand jury speculation. We're still in this world where these participants are acting as jurors in this case. And I tell them that the foreman of the jury has asked each juror to list one or two things that they might be interested in discussing during the deliberations. And then I provide this list that the other jurors, which are fictional, and which they know are considering. And so this list has a couple different things. It asks whether people are interested in whether the plaintiff has insurance, whether the defendant has insurance, whether they can see the MRI report, whether the plaintiff was wearing a seat belt, whether they think the plaintiff might lose their job. And I, I use this list for a couple different reasons. First, having a list of items makes it less obvious to these online participants that I'm really testing out insurance. And it also helps us to understand a little bit how participants are considering insurance among these external factors. And then as a secondary outcome, I do ask jurors to estimate damages. And what I find across both studies is that participants appear to be less motivated in knowing insurance information and speculating whether the plaintiff or defendant has insurance in that provisional assumption treatment than in the control. They are rating their interest as lower on that scale in the treatment condition where they have that assumption relative to the control condition. Just to make clear, right? So the control here is the usual way, which is disregard any information about insurance as opposed to assume that there is no insurance. Absolutely, yes. So in the treatment condition, we say assume no insurance. And so what we find is that participants are less interested in plaintiffs and defendants' insurance, at least in study two. And so this assumption is associated with about a 25% drop in interest, which I think is a relatively large change in behavior among other experimental studies. And the other difference that we see is that respondents who receive this provisional assumption, rather than be interested in the plaintiff's insurance status, appear to shift their interest to the plaintiff's behavior. And so there's more interest among those who receive the provisional assumption in looking at whether the plaintiff was wearing a seatbelt or not. 
you can argue about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it does suggest to me that these individual respondents or jurors are potentially shifting to information that is admissible. And I think that's what we're trying to do when we say we want to disregard information that is inadmissible. I think these results are super interesting. Certainly, it suggests that filling in the blanks does, in fact, reduce the salience of some of these questions, in this particular case about insurance. One interesting finding that I found in your study was that the provisional assumption seems to have resulted in a greater amount of damages given. And one thing that I thought was interesting about that, it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive because you would think that actually assume that defendants do not have insurance would result in less damages. But I think it in some ways bears out what Diamond and Vidmar saw, which was that the jurors perhaps are more concerned about the double counting problem, the fact that plaintiff might have insurance and therefore has already received some compensation for the injuries, rather than the deep pocket problem, which is that defendant has liability insurance, so who cares, we'll just give the plaintiff more money. Do I have that right? I share that same intuition as well. I'm reminded of the different roots of Rule 411. Some folks say that Rule 411 is really meant to protect against this deep pockets hypothesis. And other folks say, well, actually, it's really meant to be something that's much more similar to the collateral source rule. And my inclination is to say that Diamond and Vinvar, that study is relatively recent compared to those theories. And I think we should trust juror transcripts a little bit more that jurors are really concerned about the plaintiff recovering more than they should. I will say that in the second study of this paper, I don't find any differences in damages between the two conditions. And of course, this is an exploratory study, and so I don't want to put too much weight on this. But my sense is that when you give participants or jurors more information about damages, in that second study, I said, hey, I think this is how much the medical cost might cost that that actually helps to reduce the differences in damages. And we see that also in other aspects of psychological literature. When we provide information about damages, it tends to be a pretty strong anchor for jurors. And so that might be one way to fix the disparity in damages if that is something we are concerned about. So you address this problem that I'm about to offer in your paper, but here's the main concern that I have about the proposal. By telling the jury to ignore evidence seems to me to be different from telling the jury to assume the negative, which is, in your case, that there is no insurance. And so in using the provisional assumption, could we actually say that you're, in effect, changing the law? And in some ways, I think the results on these damages suggest this a little bit. Yeah, I think at first glance, it might seem that we're adding facts to the judicial record, right? And in some cases, it might be that the facts aren't true. If someone has insurance and we say to assume that they don't, then it might seem that way. I guess I have a couple different responses to this. The first, the record we have is already constructed by procedure. We already have precedents in ways where we are adding something to the law or, or kind of adding something to the record. We already assume facts, uh, not just as fact finders, but also passing down instructions to juries. We tell them to use presumptions. We tell them to use inferences in the civil trial setting. And I, I want to highlight inferences in particular because I think that they serve a function that goes beyond informational. They're already used as sanctions. And so I think that there's precedent there to say that you could have a provisional assumption that serves a similar function. The other thing that I would say is that when we ask jurors to assume information, I trust jurors to know that that is an assumption and to necessarily know that that may not be true. And so one of the highlights, I think, of the provisional assumption is that it provides a guidepost to jurors about what the law is asking them to do. And so it might be the case that whatever's happening in terms of the parties having insurance might not exactly be true, but we're, we are telling the jurors, you know, assume no insurance. This is what Rule 411 is asking us to do. To be clear, I don't have a stance on whether the rule should be assume no insurance or assume insurance because it could go differently. But 
what the paper is really trying to get at is that we do need to standardize the rule around this prohibition to correctly reflect what we think the law's reasoning with the exclusion. There's a bit of a philosophical question here about what evidence rules mean. It seems to me that the idea of a provisional assumption works great if we're interpreting evidence rules from a purposivist perspective. So if what you're trying to do is further the purpose of the statute, which is when we say you're not allowed to consider insurance, we actually mean we want you to assume that the party doesn't have insurance, then that works great. But I think it's a bit more ambiguous from a textualist perspective. If you tell the jury not to consider evidence, I think there's an argument that textually you're telling the jury to assume either a flat prior, meaning deep uncertainty, we don't know anything about it, or just the base rate in the population. So it's not that the defendant has no insurance, but you should assume that the defendant may have a probability of having insurance at the same rate as everybody else in the population. This is not the context of your study, but I think about this in the character context. When we say that character is inadmissible, it's not really that we assume that the party has good character or bad character. I think that the rule is telling us that we should just assume that the person has average character. Do you disagree with my characterization and this dichotomy I'm posing between a purpose-based interpretation and a textualist interpretation? I would agree with that characterization, and I, I do think that I probably am a little bit more purposivist in that approach. I think what I would say is that if we're thinking about this textualist approach, and I'm reminded of what is said in the guidance around these rules about insurance is a consideration that just generates you know, some forms of bias, I guess what I would say is it's still really not satisfying to jurors. I really am reminded of this image where the jurors are asking, what is the information? And they're sort of right at a standstill. And so I do think a more purposeful approach is really necessary in that context. The researcher in me says, I think there's a lot to study in the textual approach. I think that you could, for instance, design a study that says, well, here's the base rate of people who have insurance. And are you going to make considerations on that base rate? You could vary the base rate and see. But I think that people care about fairness and consistency. And part of having this assumption in play is to really reduce the noise on both sides. I think people can vary quite a bit in terms of what they think the base rate is. And I think in a similar way, people can really vary in their interpretation of what having or not having insurance means. And this is one way to standardize it, to say we're actually all going to start at the same prior together. And if somebody on the jury is really confused, you're going to go back to this assumption and you're going to hang your hat on that assumption and make decisions resulting from that assumption. So it's really about getting everyone on the same page within a jury and then in terms of the relationship between the jury and the judge and the whole court together. Final question for you. What's next for this project? There are a lot of directions I'd like to push this. I think in order to get something like this out in the real world, it means that we have to test boundary conditions. We have to think about what rules these might actually effectively apply to. I think one way that I would like to test this is to say, well, what sort of information does this provisional assumption run up against? Are there ways in which leaking information then validates the provisional assumption, really testing those boundary conditions so that this can be deployed in the real world. The other thing that I've been considering is that this sort of general intuition where it's so hard to disregard information that you already know also has implications for areas outside the federal rules of evidence. And so one of the projects that I've been working on has been thinking about how can employers disregard really salient information they shouldn't be making considerations on like age, race, or gender? And how can you use information from that to provide proof of discrimination, for example? Well, Heidi, thanks for a really intriguing idea on how to implement the evidence rules. And I look forward to seeing where your future research takes things. Great having you on the show. Likewise. Thank you so much.
Using provisional assumptions is such a clever idea. Humans are bad at preventing ourselves from thinking about things. We also seem to hate having gaps in information. So in light of both of these things, rather than telling jurors to disregard evidence, why not just tell jurors to assume certain facts? That way, the gaps are filled, and the jurors are in a way role-playing. It's not, please decide this case while half-blindfolded, but rather it's, if these facts were true, how would you decide the case? And the best part is, according to Heidi's studies, it looks like this framing trick actually works, at least in the insurance context. I'd like to go back for a minute, though, to the theoretical discussion that Heidi and I had at the end of the interview, the one about what inadmissibility actually means. This is an issue that I think we as evidence scholars don't talk about often enough. When the law declares certain evidence inadmissible, what is it actually trying to do? Does it want the jury to actually operate in ignorance? or to assume population base rates, or to actually assume some fact. And to make this a little less abstract and more concrete, what does it mean for Rule 411 to say that evidence of liability insurance is inadmissible to show negligence? Are jurors supposed to behave as if there's truly no information? Or are they supposed to use their experience to assume some base rate of insurance out in the world. Or, as Heidi suggests, perhaps jurors are actually supposed to decide on the assumption that there's no insurance at all. I suspect that, depending on context, the answer may vary quite considerably. But the ambiguity here also raises a long-standing gripe of mine, which is that the law and this is usually legislatures, the law sometimes uses admissibility rules instead of just imposing a substantive rule of law. Rather than saying, failure to wear a seatbelt doesn't constitute contributory negligence, a statute will often say, the failure to wear a seatbelt is inadmissible to prove negligence. The admissibility rule creates all of the ambiguities that I discussed with Heidi. The substantive rule doesn't. So maybe we should be a bit more careful about using admissibility rules when a simple substantive rule would suffice. In any event, Heidi's thought-provoking piece is definitely worth your time. I look forward to seeing where her project goes from here. Support for Excited Utterance is generously provided by Vanderbilt Law School's Brandstetter Litigation and Dispute Resolution Program, as well as the University of Arkansas School of Law. The associate producer is Alex Nunn, and the production editor is Madeline DiPietro. Additional production assistance is provided by Kyra Hammond, and music is provided by the Vanderbilt University Blair School of Music's Children's Cello Choir under the direction of Kirsten Castle Greer. I'm your host, Ed Chang, and I hope you'll join us again next time when we take on another new work in the world of evidence and proof. Thank you.